for us, China is sort of at the moment two spectrums. What we're seeing is certainly some reasonably good uh, delivery in relation to the green economy, in relation to the manufacturing side of the equation, and also uh, automotive vehicles as such. The area that we're also seeing is completion on the real estate side of things. What we're not seeing at the moment is new starts. And that's the focus with the Politburo and their policies. Uh, they're certainly recognising the issue. That is important for us from a steel uh, manufacturing perspective. Uh, what we're concentrating on is seeing how those policies actually flow through to new start demand. But I think it's important just to also put it in context that this will still be the fifth year in a row that the steel output in China will be over a billion tonnes. Uh, and that is significant. If analysts and suppliers to China, such as yourself, are asking now how effective the Chinese government's policy or stimulus push is going to be, isn't BHP's forecast of a 2% recovery in global steel production this year unlikely to materialise? Well, we've always said that, that the China part of the steel equation will plateau over the medium term. So the question is, how quickly do we get to that sort of 2% level? Uh, I will also contrast that to actually say, have a look at India, which is also seeing significant growth in overall steel output. And it's important to actually put into context both China and India represent over half the world's GDP growth. So we're still very focused on the China side of things. Uh, what we are also seeing there is the blast furnaces, which are critical for our iron ore uh, supply into China, are running at about 90% capacity. So they're still running well. What we have seen is the electric arc furnaces, which more rely on recycled uh, copper, are the area that have been greater impacted. Do you see India picking up any shortfall from China in terms of iron ore demand in future years? Yeah, we do. Uh, and certainly um, we see India as being a fairly robust part of the economy. Uh, it will provide growth in relation to not only where we see iron ore, but also on the met coal side of things. Again, they are largely blast furnaces, so they need that hard premium coking coal, which is what we have in our coal assets in Queensland. Uh, so both sides of the equation into India will be a positive for the overall steel output. And so how do you see the price moving over the longer term, particularly as Rio Tinto's Simindu mine comes online? Well, certainly in our long-term forecast, we always had Simindu coming in. So that has been factored into our projections. Uh, I'll start by actually saying if you look at the cost side of the equation, you have seen the overall cost curve move up. Now, I'll reference the fact that our Western Australian iron ore output was a record production for the year just gone, and we saw our C1 cash costs increase 5%. That's actually created a greater margin between us as the lowest cost producer in the world versus our competitors. But that cost curve has moved up. As a result of that, what we are seeing is price stability at somewhere between $80 and $100 a tonne. Uh, flowing through, as the marginal uh, producers need to actually still get a, an economic return. BHP finalised its acquisition of Oz Minerals in May to meet increasing demand for critical minerals. How do you view Australia's future in this space and how likely is Australia to build sovereign capability in processing? We do think that the South Australian Copper Province is an exciting opportunity for us and that will lead to processing in country. Uh, we've been public around that we're looking at a two-stage smelter at our Olympic Dam site, and we now need to scale that to factor in Carabatina, Prominent Hill, and our deposit that we've recognised in Oak Dam as well, and see how that all feeds into that province. Uh, we need to ensure at the end of the day we have the right policy settings to enable that to happen. But critical minerals is going to be a key focus for us. What do you make of the Queensland government's threat to cancel BHP's mining leases? Well, look, I'll start by saying we agree with the Treasurer in the sense that Queensland has some of the world's best hard coking coal. What we've said is we will continue to invest up to a billion dollars in maintaining that operation and running it forward. Our focus is how do we do that successfully, uh, understanding that there's risk and returns that we need to get for our in, uh, shareholders. And in that regard, any growth has to compete. 
and it's hard to see how that actually plays out. But the operation is a core part to our strategy moving forward. While we've got you, can you confirm uh, former WA Premier Mark McGowan is joining the ranks of BHP? Look, I would just say I think Mark would be an acquisition to, to any company. I'm not going to comment on whether he will or won't be joining uh, or providing any services in, into BHP other than to say that we respect Mark and think that he'd be addition to any co part, part of corporate Australia. David Lamont, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate the interest in BHP.